Hello, Tivo. Hello, hello, everyone. I can see you now all. Um, okay, so we just uh, uh, heard um, Adam telling us about the uh, recent uh, triumphs in cell force, and uh, I, I want to take us uh, back um, a decade or so to a moment uh, in the development of, of the field of cell force that I think was a, a pivotal in, in, in shaping the, uh, uh, the program uh, of, of research on cell force in, in, the, in, the, in the past uh, decade. And I'm, I'm talking here, I'm referring to uh, the paper um, uh, by people uh, from 2010 in which he uh, first uh, developed in his interest in cell force. And um, as I was um, sort of uh, going back to this uh, paper to try to uh, think what I'm going to uh, say, I, I realized somewhat to, to my surprise that uh, much of what happened later in the field is all, was already there in some shape or form in, in that paper. Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to uh, t t make the point of sort of built a thesis here that uh, uh, there's, a, there's a clear line leading from that paper to many of the things you've just heard about uh, from, from Adams. It was all already there in some, some shape already in that uh, great paper. Okay, so, um, yes, yeah, so here's a plan. I, a plan I will uh, tell you what's the, uh, what the, uh, what the landscape was in self also uh, as of um, 2010, turn of the, of the decade. Um, um, and then I will describe to you um, Thiebaud's paper, 2010, on the um, cell force and, and EOB, um, in which he describes uh, different ways in which you can use cell force information and to inform and help develop uh, the, the EOB uh, model. So I'll call them the, here the cell force handles, because they were hand, like handles on the geometry. Uh, of the two-body system. Uh, then I'll go one by one and tell you what uh, calculations have been done uh, on those six uh, uh, handles um, and what sort of um, what the uh, uh, profits uh, were from this kind of calculation, all the follow-on follow uh, calculation. Of it. And I'll finish with a little reflection on the role that this uh, work uh, had on the uh, sort of building an agenda of a program uh, for, for the cell force community, I think was extremely successful. Okay, so that was the situation uh, at 2010. We have had already a, uh, an equation of motion, the first order equation of motion uh, for the cell force uh, for uh, almost a decade, a decade and a half. Um, progress uh, was uh, quite slow. Uh, I, I think, um, yes, it's probably fair to say that a constant source of frustration, uh, Thibault's frustration was with, with slowness and the slowness at which we move in the cell force uh, community. And much of the work in that, in that first decade was about trying to convert this equation of motion into practical calculation schemes so we can you know, calculate those Emory orbits. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, progress on that. And, um, I think it's fair to say that the main problem was what we call the gauge problem, which is that the equation of motion was formulated in one gauge, which was not the gauge in which people normally do black hole perturbation theory. Uh, and so people uh, tried to resolve this in two different ways. First, uh, first was to reformulate black hole perturbation theory in the gauge in which we have the cell force. And the opposite way was to uh, uh, reformulate the cell force in the gauges in which people were used to do calculations. And in the end, both things worked, but until they did work, um, much of the work was on cell, for, uh, self, um, cell force uh, due to a scalar uh, field. In, so cell force on a scalar charge. And so if you go to literature, you'll see that 95% you know, of the work was done on scalar field and other toy model, like electromagnetism in curved space time. Uh, the first successes and calculations of gravitational cell force came, came in 2007, and immediately afterwards, we were uh, starting to make connection with the real world. So up until that point, it was really an effort of a small sort of niche community. Uh, and from that point, we started to get some physics out of all that. And so, yeah, the first two examples were the calculation of the uh, redshift by uh, Steve Detweiler, and the calculation of the East Coast shift uh, due to the cell force by myself with uh, Nori Sago. Um, and this kind of uh, early results, uh, I think, also attracted uh, Thibault to, to the field. Uh, that was an important 
uh, result by itself to attack people to, uh, to the field. Um, uh, but I, uh, it's, it's important for me, for my point, to emphasize here that when we did this calculation, we didn't quite have a clear sense of why we are doing them. Well, uh, we wanted to test our Salesforce results, and it's good to have comparison with post-Newtonian results, but uh, we didn't really appreciate that these things can be more important than just that. And, and we didn't get that appreciation until Thibault uh, Thibault came and, and really showed us this in his, in his paper. So here is the paper, uh, Gravitational Self-Force in Schwarzschild Background and the Effective one body Formalism. It was uh, um, submitted in October 2009 and uh, published in January 2010, so nicely at the beginning of the decade to hold the start of a new decade of Self-Force research. I will just read to you the first sentence uh, because it says uh, it's all. Uh, we discuss various ways in which the computation of conservative gravitational self-force effects on a point mass moving in a Schwarzschild background can inform us about the basic building blocks of the effective one body Hamiltonian. Uh, and there were six, six such, such ways that were described, or six handles. The first was the ISCO frequency. Uh, the second was the periaston advance on uh, slightly eccentric orbits in the limit of circularity. And the third was um, ADM-like en energy and angular momentum of the binary of the binary system. And, and of course, um, you know, the non-trivial piece of the uh, of the energy is quadratic in the in the small in the mass of the small object. So, so People pointed out you would have to go to second order uh, cell force, which seemed like a very, very remote prospect uh, at, at the time. It, it indeed, it took another 10 years until Adam was able to calculate it, and you saw the result a moment ago. Um, but uh, Tibble suggested uh, that before this is also available, we can have a handle on the energetics um, if using first order perturbation, black hole perturbation theory, so using first order cell force by looking at a special orbit. And this is this orbit here. It's the orbit that is marginally bound. It starts at zero velocity at infinity, and then it falls in and gets trapped uh, at uh, un the unstable circular orbit at 4m. So you have to turn off dissipation for this orbit to actually happen. And because you're starting at infinity, you have well-defined energy, and you can uh, relate that to the Hamiltonian of, of the EOB. And you can calculate two things. You can calculate the uh, shift in the critical value of the angular momentum that you need for this trapping to happen, or, or equivalently shift in the value of the uh, impact parameter. And you can calculate the shift in the frequency of the uh, asymptotic circular orbit. And finally, uh, much to my surprise, I found that scatter angle uh, calculations in uh, hyperbolic uh, encounters, that was already there in the paper, in, uh, at least uh, philosophically. Um, it was mentioned then. Uh, you can see the, the budding of the ideas. Uh, they're all there, already in, in that paper. So those of us who work in, in uh, or excited about these calculations um, may be surprised to hear that it was already there. Okay, so ISCO shift. Uh, so I'm going to go uh, one by one and tell you about those experiments and where they took us and why they were uh, important. Uh, ISCO shift, so uh, here's my uh, mass notation. I'm going to follow here, follow here the mass notation of, of the paper, the 2010 paper. And um, this slide uh, shows the perspective of self force. The next slide will show the perspective of VOB and then we'll put them together. Um, right, so. At the geodesic level, the motion, as uh, we, we are all familiar, can be described in terms of a radial potential, effective potential in a precise uh, form, uh, so that if you have a fixed constant uh, uh, motion, uh, angular momentum constant, constant of motion, you have an effective potential that looks like that, that supports uh, uh, a single, uh, has a single minimum that, it, that corresponds to uh, stable circular orbit, as you decrease the angular momentum, and we are in Schwarzschild uh, geometry here, uh, the orbit um, um, shifts to the left, so smaller radii, until a point, a critical value of the angular momentum where this uh, minimum disappears, you get an inflection point, and you don't have any more 
bound orbits below that value. So the, this marginal orbit, the innermost stable circular orbit, ISCO happens to be at 6m, and you find it by looking for an inflection point of that effective potential. Now, if you add a cell force to the equation of motion, the location of this uh, inflection point moves a little by a small amount proportional to the mass ratio, um, and you find that the ISCO is shifted a little. Now, the shift in the coordinate isn't too meaningful because of gauge dependence, uh, but instead you can look at the shift of the frequency of the ISCO, and you can form this nice dimensionless quantity by multiplying by the total mass. And then you have the structure where you have a geodesic value, just six to the minus three halves, uh, plus some self-force correction that in, it, it's encapsulated by this coefficient, C omega. And since we knew how to calculate uh, self-force, we could calculate this C omega, and this is the uh, result we obtained. It's a numerical calculation with an error power on it. This is the result. And then you can, for example, compare it with uh, post-Newtonian calculations. Uh, and so this is a result we got uh, later with uh, the vault uh, when we have uh, access to the energetics of the orbit once the first law of binary black holes was formulated. I'll talk about this in a moment. And now we can do the same thing from an EOB point of view. Uh, so if you look at the EOB Hamiltonian at uh, uh, near circularity, it has this kind of structure. There is an a priori non a uh, function of the EOB inverse radius U and of symmetric mass ratio. Um, and uh, this J is a parameter, it's an angular momentum. Um, and you, to make connection with cell force, you want to expand that in the small mass ratio. So nu is a symmetric mass ratio. Uh, and, then, um, and then you're looking for inflection and inflection point of, of this potential. And so um, you when you identify it, you get a relation between the location of the ISCO and these a priori unknown functions A that capture the order Q or the mass ratio part of the EO, main EOB potential. Uh, and so you get, because you need two derivatives to get the inflection, you get uh, that the radius depends on, on this A evaluated at the ISCO and the first and second derivative. And in mean, the last stage, you want to convert that to frequency so you can extract this C coefficient or the EOB version of that C coefficient, and you get something like that. And knowing what the cell force value is, knowing this exact benchmark, uh, tells you now, gives you a constraint um, on the value of A and its derivative at uh, the E scope. Now, if you're interested in the, in the post Newtonian, expansion of, of this unknown function, which is um, um, the way it was presented uh, at the beginning of, of EOB, uh, you also get constraint between the coefficients of that expansion. So two of them were known from post theory. There was a long quest for the next one, the A5 and the A6 and so on. And this kind of comparison with self force results allows us for, for the first time to put a very tight constraint that related those coefficients. And this really doesn't sound much from our point of view, where we now have these coefficients analytically to very high order. But back then, it was something completely new, a completely new way of um, calibrating those uh, EOB coefficients using new information in the strong field. So no longer you, do you need to extrapolate from infinity using post theory. Now we have a, an anchor point in the strong, strong field. So we're talking about interpolation, which is much better. Right, but this is just one point. And in the paper, uh, Thibault immediately also suggested a whole function like that, the functional relation that can serve as a dictionary between cell force and EOB calculation. And um, that function is essentially the periastron advance in the limit of circular orbit. You can, you can calculate as a function of the frequency of the circular orbit. So you form this uh, convenient function, this omega r, r here is the, um, frequency of the radial oscillations about the minimum. So at leading order, this object, if you perturb it a little around the circular orbits, perform um, harmonic oscillations with the radial frequency, omega r. And you divide it by omega to get something dimensional, dimensionless that doesn't depend on your time parameterization. Uh, and it also has a simple interpretation in terms of the uh, angle of advance per, per cycle. Um, and so if you expand that in a mass ratio, you get the leading order that is just Schwarzschild, very simple, one minus six X, 
And here X is a radius, inverse radius, that's defined from the frequency, um, plus some self-force correction, this function rho. And in this first collaboration with Tibol, we calculated this function rho in self-force. These are these blue uh, data points. And we did a comparison with the then available self-force is a post-Newtonian approximants to this. And so now you can see nicely how you get a nice agreement at infinity and you can follow on this uh, comparison all the way to the strong field and it gives you a handle on how the post-Newtonian expansion behaves in a very strong field, at least down to the ISCO here. And that was new, that was entirely new. Uh, and again, you can do it, uh, you can do it in, in the OB. Uh, so from the OB Hamiltonian, you can write a radial equation of motion and you perturb about a, a circular orbit. And that gives you uh, also an expression for the radial frequency in terms of the um, EOB potential. Um, the, here you uh, also have a dependence on the secondary potential, the D potential uh, associated with quadratic terms in the radial uh, momentum. Um, and, and then you can, uh, you can write down an expression for the same quantity, this omega over angular frequency. Uh, this time it involves the two potentials that here expanded in power, powers of the mass ratios. And so again, in the last stage, you convert the frequency and you write then the EOB equivalent of this row function. It has this form here. So now knowing this function in cell force, in principle, gives you an ODE now, a differential equation for the entire potential. Uh, well, it's coupled, so you can't solve it quite yet, but you have a couple equations for uh, that relates these two potentials everywhere, everywhere from infinity and down to the down to the ISCO. And so now we have uh, we have a, a control over the functional form of the of the EOB uh, potential. And if you want to work in a plus Newtonian uh, uh, framework, you can then get, uh, get not one, just one relation or constraint on the plus Newtonian parameters of those things, but very many, because now you can fit to a function, you can extract order by order those plus Newtonian coefficients. Now at that point, I think Thibault realized that he doesn't need to wait for us to do self-calculations, -calcula self-force calculation, he could do it himself. Um, and, and him being him, he can do them analytically, uh, if, if, uh, if, if all you want is to do post calculations, then you can solve the perturbation equations around the uh, Schwarzschild black hole uh, analytically, order by order in post -Newtonian. So you do a double expansion, PN and GSF. And there started a very successful research program um, in collaboration with uh, Donato Bini and later with uh, Andrea Geralico. Um, which quickly attracted many, many other participants and, and, and soon everyone was crunching PN parameters. And I think it's fair to say that at some moment uh, around this time, uh, most of the people in the Kappa community were calculating uh, the post parameters, uh, entirely bewitched by this. And it was a real to the, to the force. So uh, you can see here results from uh, the paper, the 2016 paper for the function rho analytically expanded in a post series. 6.5 pn, 8 pn, and 9.5 uh, pn, and 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 this is grand, and and this was really useful for calibrating EOB. This immediately improved, uh, went for improving the EOB model, and that immediately went to LIGO, you know, detection uh, pipelines and so on. So this this work had a had a huge uh, impact on on the field. And then you can draw these uh, nice uh, plots that where you take the cell force data. And you subtract order by order uh, the an analytical uh, terms, and you see how you, you get uh, faster and faster convergence. But now you really have a handle on the convergence of the PN series in the strong field, so near the east. Coast. Now, if there's something important I learned from Tibol is that ISCO is not strong field. Now, after all, one over six is only halfway between zero and one over three. So you can't, with this bound orbit, it's, uh, it's hard to get below, below the ISCO. And you do want to go below the ISCO uh, to the really strong field. And that you can do with energy. And uh, as I mentioned before, the paper mentioned that possibility of using second order um, and binding uh, energy. Uh, again, a remote, very remote prospect uh, back then. So I'm just flashing the plot that Adam showed you before, but I want to emphasize 
one feature of it, which is that if you, you can calculate the binding energy of unstable orbit below the E square and all the way down to the light ring. This, this is this, this portion here. So it gives you much more handle on the really strong field uh, part. Uh, fortunately, uh, soon after Tibble's paper, there was uh, this um, um, remarkable idea of, of the first law of uh, binary uh, black holes that allowed us or provided a kind of uh, local energy that's accessible from the first order metric perturbation. Um, so it's written here as formulated in this paper from Litiek, Paraus, and Bonanno. Given um, the, the first order perturbation, you can construct uh, this quantity, the, the Twiler uh, redshift, is one of the inverse of the four velocity of the object along, along its trajectory, um, expand it in, in, in small mass ratio. And given that redshift function, you can construct uh, um, uh, the binding energy um, to order uh, cell force. And as a first test, you can also locate the ISCO by minimizing uh, uh, this binding energy and you get, and you get the same result. Uh, and so now you have access to the energetic of the problem uh, from the first order perturbation and you can take it down to the light ring. This is what we did in later collaboration with Tibol. Uh, here we have a calculation of the binding energy uh, all the way down to the, to the light ring now. And so uh, that was very helpful. It's, uh, it helps, for example, detect an, an issue with the cell force, uh, sorry, with the EOB formulation, a certain divergence at uh, the light ring that was later resolved by changing the, the gauge of, of the EOB uh, formulation. And later on, we, uh, when there was a formulation of the first law for eccentric orbits, uh, it, was also, it also allowed this kind of uh, game to uh, calibrate the, the last potential of the EOB a formulation, the Q potential that's associated with high eccentricity. Right, but going back to the paper, before second order formulation uh, uh, of cell force was known, or is known, and before uh, the formulation, the first law was uh, known, um, Thibault said we, we could still uh, use uh, a first order information to get a handle of the dynamics, and that was uh, that's done by looking at uh, by, uh, unbounded orbits. Um, so the first idea was to use, uh, use this uh, marginally bound orbit, which I uh, discussed before, which is a kind of funny thing where the in state, you start with an in state that is two particles infinitely separated in flat space, and the out state, uh, state is a tightly bound orbit, strong field that has helical symmetry. And that's very useful because you can relate the notion of energy in helical symmetry to the notion to the usual Bondi, uh, Bondi notion of energy at, at infinity. And so given the cell force, we can calculate two things on it. We can calculate the shift in the critical value of the angular momentum and the shift in the asymptotic uh, frequency. And that gives you a direct handle on the EOB potential. EOB is a Hamiltonian formulation. So if you know the energy, you immediately can translate it to information on the potentials uh, without the intermediation of the first law. And it provides a check also on the first law formulation. And that calculation we did uh, much, much later. It took uh, many more years because uh, almost every, all the cell force technology, the computation technology is, is adjusted or adapted to bound orbits. It took a lot of time for us to be able to do unbound orbits. And, and these are the results. Um, so this is the uh, normalized, um, uh, at frequency of the of the last uh, yeah, of the uh, symptotic orbit, and this is the shift, and uh, this is the angular momentum. So you can see that the cell force uh, shift the angular momentum by something like right. zero point three mass ratio inwards. So you need to shoot the particle slightly more inwards in order to be, for it to be captured. This is without radiation, and the final frequency is a bit uh, larger. Now back to the uh, oh. Finally, the, uh, the last uh, uh, thing that was mentioned, last handle that was mentioned, a scatter angle uh, in hyperbolic uh, encounters. So here, instead of looking at a particular unbound orbit, we have a two parameter family uh, of orbit parameterized with say, uh, center of mass energy and impact parameter. Uh, and you can define this uh, 
this uh, scatter angle unambiguously from the out and the in uh, state uh, of the system. And that's nice because it allows you to probe all the way into the to the light ring, light ring with sufficiently high energy. And this is this is the usual thing that physicists do when they want to explore new things. They throw things at it, right? That, so this is how you explore the atoms. So, so this is the classical uh, probe experiment in in relativity: how to probe a black hole. Now, uh, by 2016, I think uh, Thibault gave up on us calculating this in cell force. So we he went on and, and show a completely new way of uh, calibrating EOB using Posminkovskian information uh, on chi. So there's a whole new dictionary that translates with Posmin from Posminkovskian to EOB and deserves its own, its own uh, talk. There was a lot of interest around the time because there was fast progress in PM theory because new participants came, people from QCD amplitudes didn't know how to calculate this thing and found a way of converting their calculations to, to gravity calculations. Um, yeah. and, uh, this is this is my yeah. I have one more slide after that, and I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Yes, I'll be I'll be brief. Uh, so, in in brief, uh, Thibault um, had a very important point to make, which is knowledge of chi uh, at uh, one GSF. So, knowledge of the first order self force correction to chi, in fact, determines the full PM dynamics. The full in, meaning not and not only leading mass ratio, but all mass ratios up to 4 p.m. order. That comes simply from uh, dimensional analysis and some observation about symmetry under mass exchange in, in, this, in the object. If you have uh, the second order self force, you can get all the way to 6 p.m. So there's a very strong motivation now to do this calculation with self force. And plus the fact that, of course, self force results gives you always the full thing at all the mass ratio uh, to all Postminkovskian all this, all the, also the strong field information. We still don't have a calculation, self of calculation of the scatter angle, but we are getting there promptly now, finally. Uh, so these are some results from a recent paper. Uh, and what I show here is a particle in a scatter orbit around a Schwarzschild black hole, we're calculating a certain complex health potential from which we get the metric perturbation and the cell force by taking derivatives. And you can see the form of it, uh, periastron is here, time equals zero. So this is calculated along the orbit. And here on the right, this is the radiation at null infinity. And you can see some interesting strong field features here. These are, these are echoes from the passage of the particle around the, uh, the periastron back reacting with the particle itself. So not clear if we see those kind of features with a uh, low order PM calculations. We have several codes now like that, time domain, frequency domain. We do comparison, we, we are just about now to start calculations of the scatter angle. And hopefully this will allow us to go back to Thibault and try to extract the physics from that. So just to get to my uh, conclusions here, a quick reflections on this, on this, um, uh, on this, on this, the progress that was made. Uh, uh, um, importance of that paper. So uh, I think it's fair to say that the paper started a new program in, which involved many, many people and it is still ongoing and going very strong. And that led to significant improvement in wafer models for gravitational wave detectors. And to put the fingers of, on three new, completely new ideas that were there and really helped shape the, the way people think about these things uh, was first conservative cell force gives you a handle on the strong field potential. So it's not only about calculating the acceleration to get an Imri orbit, you can get uh, your information uh, about the uh, uh, gravitational potential in a very strong field. A second is a completely new way of calibrating the OB potential beforehand, only PN. Now we have handles in the strong field using cell force information. And the third, and that takes me now to Adam Adam Stoke is, is the insistence of, of, on using uh, the symmetric mass ratio instead of the ordinary mass ratios. It wasn't stated explicitly in the paper, but it, in, way, in a way it, for, it, 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 it was foreseeing uh, what will happen next, which was we'll realize that when you do that, uh, you can use cell force information to, in fact, get, get very accurate results at all mass ratios as, as Adam, Adam illustrated. Uh, so, so that's it. Uh, thank you very much, Thibault. It's, it's been uh, 
It's been a real pleasure of working with you, and I hope that we'll uh, we'll have more opportunity to work in the new in the new future. future. So, thank you and, and happy birthday. Thank you. So since time is uh, going faster, uh, I suggest that unless Tibo has a comment, no, uh, we will just, just I wanted to. Thank Leo, thank the organizers. Yes. <laughs> so we thank you thank again. All the speakers. <laughs> yes. And uh, uh, the, um, Alessandro had to go, in fact, because the time is running fast. So thank you to all those who are in the room and those who may be seen from somewhere else. And uh, we saw just a small fraction of uh, the, the number of 100 or 200 collaborators you had all over your career. And many, many, I want to insist on that, are uh, young people who started, who are starting in the various fields. So you still have a lot of work to do to teach the younger generation. So thank you to all. And the conference is closed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.